Hi everybody, Mark here from AmericanAeration.com and in today's video I want to briefly talk about uh, some tips that I have for you if you're looking to do something in a DIY form of pond aeration. The topic of DIY is very popular these days and I'm all for it because it helps people save money, particularly those on a budget that are trying to keep the cost down of, of investing in their pond a bit, but they want the advantages that aeration can give them. And uh, so, you know, despite the fact that I have worked in commercial aeration for many years, I understand the need for, uh, for that kind of flexibility. And, uh, and so hopefully some tips here will help you as you go through your research and as you design a system for your pond. And, uh, you know, this is kind of rudimentary. It's not going to be super in-depth, but, um, but definitely I think it's a start. So we'll, we'll cover more. If you have questions, leave those below uh, in, you know, in the comment section of YouTube. And uh, we'll try to address those in some other videos that we put together. But in a nutshell, let's, let's start with this. So we've got three components in a typical aeration system. You've got the land-based pump. You've got some form of airline which is feeding that air from the pump down to a diffuser that sits at the bottom of the pond. That is subsurface diffused aeration. It is, in my opinion, the preferred way to aerate a pond for a variety of reasons, from economic and budgetary reasons and cost of operation to the actual effects that you get in the pond and um, ease of maintenance and all that kind of stuff. So uh, with that all in mind, um, I also want to address a very basic premise that I have, and that is, and the reason that I think DIY is useful for some people. I do think that when somebody says, well, any aeration is better than no aeration at all, I agree with that. Uh, I think there are different levels of aeration, different levels of quality and effect and, and all that, but I do think that almost anyone can benefit from increasing the circulation and the turnover in their pond and increasing oxygen in various ways. But part of what I'm going to discuss today is about optimizing that to the best of your ability. So we'll get into that a bit later on when we talk about diffusers. Let's start at the pump though, land-based pump. What you will typically see used in the DIY realm of pond aeration is what's called a linear compressor. These are septic tank type um, compressors or pumps that are uh, using diaphragms to create the air. They tend to be very quiet. They tend to be extremely economical to run, usually just a few bucks a month to run. And uh, they can put out quite a bit of air. They have one limitation though that may affect your decision and that is depth capability. Be sure that whatever pump you're looking at getting or thinking about getting, make sure that you contact the manufacturer or the distributor or retailer and find out what the depth rating is on that pump because typically most of these linear pumps will work down to about eight feet. Some may go a few more feet but uh, there are others that may not do well beyond six feet and so you definitely want to cover your bases there. You've got to go out and determine how deep your pond is I think anyway you should do that so that you can get gallon estimates and volume estimates on your pond. Uh, for many reasons it's good to know that but ultimately with a a diffuser system like this and a subsurface system you definitely got to know what you're dealing with on your depths and where you put the diffusers will matter so probably near the middle of the pond find out how deep you are if you are eight feet or less be sure to check with your the, the pump you're looking at and the, the person selling that but uh, eight feet or less probably in the ballpark if it's beyond eight feet or deeper than eight feet, you most likely will have to look at something like a rocking piston compressor instead of a linear. And um, they are workhorses for us in, in the commercial realm, and they're relatively affordable and relatively efficient. Not quite as much as the, the linears, but they handle depths from you know six feet all the way to almost 50 feet. And so they're very, very versatile pumps. and. Uh, uh, it's just something you're going to have to consider if your depth is, is greater than eight feet. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and this has more to do with these rocking piston designs, although linears can be affected too. 
not all of the pumps are weatherproof. In other words, some of the linear designs that you see will have a weatherproof casing on them or cover on them. So you don't need to do anything else. But there are uh, some linears that are not weatherproof and there are most of the rocking pistons, I guess, are not weatherproof at all. They're just the bare pumps, but they need protection from the elements. They cannot get wet. And the other thing specific to the rocking piston pump is that in its operation, it's meant to run 24-7. They're great continuous duty pumps, but they get very hot. You would not want to touch the top of the piston cap um, after it's been running a while. And so if you're going to build your own cover, um, which many people do, again, to save on costs. Factory cabinets are kind of expensive, but all factory cabinets that we sell, commercial cabinets, have cooling fans in them. So I would look for a cooling fan, uh, inexpensive exhaust fan. If you build your own cabinet, make sure it's well ventilated, and make sure that it keeps the pump dry, and get a fan that's pulling the heat out of that box. If you don't, when people have misjudged that uh, element, they have melted parts off pumps. And so definitely with rocking pistons, you got to keep them cool. And ideally, you got to keep them pretty clean too. So, you know, try to pick an area where the pump's not in a bunch of, you know, filth and dust and whatever, and you'll get better life out of whatever you're using, uh, you know, if you can keep it in good shape. So as we move on down the line and we talk about the airline, one cost saving area is looking at polyline. It's an unweighted, inexpensive polyline. Usually 3 eighths is typical, and that would run from the pump to the diffuser in the pond. I have a problem with the poly. One, you gotta go through a lot of rigmarole to weight that thing down and keep it down, unless you just don't mind it floating on the surface, which I don't care for. Uh, especially if I'm fishing, I want the thing out of the way. But the polyline, is not nearly as stout as the weighted line. Thick walled weighted line is extremely durable. The life uh, and warranty uh, offerings on most of this line is anywhere from five to 15 years and I don't generally see it wear out. But the nice thing about the weighted line is you put it in and it sinks and it stays down. It will not kink. Um, it's very hard to damage or cut or if you had it, uh, you know, a hook get in it, it's just likely not to hurt it. And so, um, I tend to think of the idea that unless I have a lot of airline to deal with, with most of these DIY packages, we're talking relatively small ponds. If you're running a linear compressor, you're not going to run it very far away from the pond as well. They, can't, they don't have that capability. But So that means your airline is probably going to be 100 feet or less. And for the money that you spend on the airline and the cost difference between the poly and the weighted, yeah, it's about twice as much, I would say maybe even three times as much in some cases if you find a real budget uh, deal on the poly, but it's well worth the cost difference for the, the reduction in the headache and the longevity benefits and all that. I would definitely stay with the weighted if I were building my own DIY setup. As we move into the diffusers which go into the pond, there are typically about three types you'll see. The stick diffuser form, which are just, just what a, it means, it's just a, a stick with a rubber sleeve over it that has a, a membrane pinholes in it and the air comes out of there. You've got plated diffusers where the rubber membrane is on top of an oval and the bubbles come out the top of that. And then you also have rings, uh, different forms of, of rings that would have a diffusion tube um, that creates that that ability to diffuse the air. All of the commercial things that we see, no matter the form that they're in, tend to have very, very fine uh, rubber, or they have a rubber membrane, but they have very, very fine small holes in them. Uh, one example would be this one from Easy Pro, which there's no way you're going to see the, the holes in this. They're so small, um, but there's just, I don't, I don't know the count on them, but there's a lot of little holes in this membrane plate. And <clears throat> there's a difference in, when you talk about the diffusion of, of the air, I see some people suggesting that you can take a pipe uh, of PVC and you can drill small holes in it. One, you're never going to get as small as this membrane plate with a drill. You won't do it. Um, but when we go back to the idea that any aeration is better than no aeration, um, 
I think the only difference is you need to understand the difference between coarse bubble diffusion and fine bubble diffusion. So if you're looking at a PVC pipe with holes in it, that would be a coarse bubble diffuser design. And what they are good at is creating mixing in the pond. In other words, you are able to circulate the water enough to, you know, turn it over and provide uh, more of a balance between the top and the bottom. The temperature gradients will go away. Um, you may get a little bit of oxygen from above to circulate down below, but, but not great, but it, it helps. It's a mixing type of, a, of a approach. Fine bubble diffusion actually provides much better oxygenation. That's a big thing to think about. And then it does provide mixing, but it's not as powerful as the coarse. Uh, diffusion, but it's very well balanced mixing, more gradual, um, and coupled with the increase in oxygenation, your dissolved oxygen goes up quite a bit because of the reaction of the fine bubbles at the surface. Um, and then finally, there's an economical benefit to the fine bubble diffusion. Fine bubble diffusion creates a much greater benefit with less uh, air input. In other words, you get a nice balance of all these things without having to go to a higher horsepower, whereas the coarse bubble diffusion handles higher air volume coming out, and you may need it to turn the pond over. But beyond that, you're just spending extra money to get a moderate benefit in the pond. And there are places like wastewater where coarse bubble diffusion actually is probably better in some cases. But in most ponds that have fish or you're trying to improve its condition and most of what we want as pond owners will be uh, more realized I think by using fine bubble diffusion. To get that you've got to go with something commercial uh, that you find on the marketplace. Now these sticks, these diffuser sticks are actually not very expensive and they can be hooked up in various couplings, you know, to the airline. I would tend to elevate them. I would get them off the bottom, uh, and it helps keep them cleaner and helps debris from getting in them and messing things up. Uh, I, I would say that every commercial diffuser we work with has a, a, an element of elevation where the diffusion release point is actually well above the bottom. And so I would put a, a stick or a, an oval on a milk crate or something to keep it off the off the the bottom and the mud and the muck and stuff like that and I think that's cheap and easy to do. Um, I would finally stay away from air stones. I don't like the stones as much. One, they can break, uh, and two, they tend to clog up a little easier than the um, than than the membrane, the rubber membranes. And so um, I would stay with the rubber and. Uh, look for something that has the, the very fine pinholes in it, something you like the look of and can work with easily and it looks affordable to you. Go that route and you'll be far better off than trying to drill something into a piece of PVC with, you know, larger holes. Uh, again, you'll find benefit probably in some form out of anything that you're creating to move the water in the pond. But if you want the best effect of why we would typically aerate, go with a commercial diffuser of some type, and I think you'll be a lot happier with that. So these are just a few simple things that came to mind when I started to think about what I was seeing in terms of the DIY information online. Uh, there's a lot more we could cover, of course, but um, we'll leave it at that for today. If you have any questions or need help with um, your pond or, or anything to do with pond aeration, get in touch with us at AmericanAeration.com. Happy to help. My name is Mark, and I hope you have a great day wherever you are.